of us have never known that numbers matter. And today, the Lord will help us to understand what the numbers mean. When people are three, what does that mean? <laughs> so, Sister Mary will be speaking to us now. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for our servant Mary. And have set her apart so that she can speak to us today. Give us divine wisdom uh, to be able to design um, and, and to understand what you're teaching us today. And may this information help us, O oh God, make us more effective in the place of spiritual warfare. Your grace rest upon her, give her capacity to liberate in a way that we cannot understand. In Jesus' name. Amen. I welcome you all for this prayer training program session of Intercessors for Kenya. We are using our manual, Realizing the Destiny of People, and today we'll cover Lesson 17 and Lesson 18. Possessing the significance of numbers and possessing the gates of time. So let's turn in our manuals to page 83. If you have the new version, I'm not sure which page number it is in the older version. The same, okay, okay. So, significance of numbers. We have three objectives. Lesson. To enable the Christian understand how God works in the pattern of numbers. Secondly, to capture this pattern and use it in prayer and warfare. And thirdly, to learn the place of prophetic praying in warfare. It's good to set out the objectives at the beginning because some of you might think, because I'm a person of numbers, I've come to teach you about accounting today. <laughs> but that's not what we are doing today. <laughs> because I'm sure if I was doing that, many would switch off. <laughs> So let's begin our lesson then on page 83. And as we begin this study, we need to appreciate that God works with symbols and patterns, and one of them he uses is numbers. In your manual there, there's an assignment to read through Genesis chapter 1 up to chapter 12, and underline each time that God gives us a specific number or figure. I tried that exercise, I'm not sure I was 100% successful, but it appeared over 70 times, different numbers appearing in those 12 chapters. So numbers are important in spiritual matters and in spiritual praying and prophetic praying. So let us look at a call for prophetic praying and Possessing the gate of time is a call for prophetic praying. What is prophecy? Prophecy is to speak of, about something which is not as though it was. Therefore, in prophetic praying, we speak of things desired of God as though they were, they were even though they are not. I'd like us to refer briefly to a passage in Numbers chapter 14, verse 7 to 9. The Bible says, But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, who are among those who spied out the land, tore their clothes. They tore their clothes because the Israelites were refusing to enter into the pro promised land. Verse 7. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So at that time, Joshua, uh, Joshua and Caleb were speaking of something which did not exist. But they believed God. 
Remember, they had been sent out, 12 of them. But it was only two, Caleb and Joshua, who came back with a positive report. And the, the Israelites actually wanted to stone them. If you go to verse 10, the children of Israel felt like stoning uh, Joshua and Caleb because he was saying to go forth into the land. But he spoke prophetically about the land. And later in that chapter, if you read further down, it talks about Caleb and Joshua having a different spirit than the other people, that they could perceive what God wanted to do. In 1 Corinthians 14, 1, Paul tells us, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The Bible exhorts us to desire the gift of prophecy. We should therefore ask for it from the Lord, as it will greatly enhance our prayer ministry. And prophetic praying is authoritative. It takes the form of proclamations, declarations, and assurances. And you'll recall that when David faced Goliath, he declared, this day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. We read that in 1 Samuel 17, 46. He spoke with certainty, and it came to pass, because the Lord had sent him. So when the Lord sends us, it will come to pass. In 1 Samuel 23, 17, we read what Jonathan said to his friend David. Now remember, Jonathan was the son of the king, Saul. And yet he said to his friend David, and he said it with confidence, you will be king over Israel. So he was speaking prophetically. And imagine, he's the son of the king, so he's actually the prince. So he's actually a king in waiting. But because he knew God's purposes, he declared that David would be king of Israel. So we require wisdom to pray according to the known will of God. And this takes time. If we don't know the will of God, we need to seek God out on this so that he can give us his direction. Even during this time that we are having a season of prayer and fasting, it's a time to seek from the Lord what he is saying to us at this particular time. And maybe for those who are new and even for us to revise, we can also refer back to lesson four in this manual on strategic praying. A prayer minister in praying can use scripture to make prophetic declarations, but this must be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in order for it to be prophetic. Amongst us, we have those who have the gift of prophecy and often they can proclaim the intentions of God over people, over nations, and over the church. Receiving prophetic prayer wisely. We need to test every spirit, that's what the word of God says, and test every word that it is actually from God. We read in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, treasured all these things in her heart. What were these things? This was a time the family had gone to Jerusalem for the annual Passover, and Jesus had gone to the temple. And his parents were looking for him all over the place, but suddenly they found him in the temple. And Jesus said to his mother, didn't you know that I would be in the, my father's house doing his business? So those are the things that she treasured in her heart, wondering what type of child is this that the Lord has given me to bring up? So there are things which we need to treasure in our hearts and ask the Lord to give us direction. And if it is directed of God, it will certainly come to pass. And we also know, for example, that we often like to pray for godly governance in our nation. But this requires that we teach government workers what this means. Because prayer alone is not adequate, there need to be actions taken to bring about change. I know also in our midst here, we also have 
public servants who work in government offices, parastatal offices, and God has sent you there for an assignment for the nation and also for the kingdom of God. Remember Joseph, Joseph who was brought up as the last born, he was despised by his brothers, he was sold as a slave, he was even imprisoned, but God had destined him to be the prime minister in Egypt. And all this was training for Joseph so that he could take up that responsibility. So even on our lives, our lives, God wants to train us for the responsibilities are, that are ahead of us. So let us seek the Lord to know what he wants us to know. And when we go through some of those teachings and those lessons, like Joseph's lessons were so difficult. He was his father's favorite, but he was his brother's worst enemy. Yeah, it can be tough. Then you're in prison for something you didn't do. Yeah, and you wonder, I had those dreams. I was to be great. Is it really going to come to pass? But when God has a purpose, he'll fulfill it through whatever means. And so let us hang in there and continue to look up to the Lord. We must be careful also not to manipulate answers to prove our prophetic prayer was accurate. We've seen, in, like in our nation, we see many things, but may the Lord help us to look to the real true God and hear from him. Yeah. We should be thankful for the revelations that he has given us and that he will work out everything that concerns us. We read that in Psalm 138, verse 8. Do you want to increase your effectiveness when you pray? I'm sure we all do. Eh? Learn to pray with prophetic anointing. Ask the Lord to anoint with prophetic anointing so that when you pray, great things will happen. Let's move then down to the significance of numbers. Numbers have various meanings, some by Bible scholars, and some you even find within the word of God. So number one is that there's only one God. That's the significance of one. There is only one true God. Number two, stands for the number of witnesses and testimony. By the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. For example, we read about Caleb and Joshua. So by the testimony of the goodness of the land, the promised land, it came to be. You can also read about the testimony of two in Matthew 18, verse 19. Number three represents a triad of completeness in the Bible, and sometimes it might be of good things or of bad things. So it's a group or a set of related things. For example, the triune God or the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There's also the Trinity of evil, the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The Trinity of blessing, grace, mercy and peace. There's a trinity of wickedness, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And there's the trinity of scriptures, the law, the prophets, and the writings, and many more. I will not read all of them. You can continue to read. We know that Christ also rose on the third day, and man is body, soul, and spirit. Let's move on to number four. Number four represents God's absolute control over the world. And it's represented in the cosmic order of his creation. We know there are four phases of the moon, the new moon, the first quarter, the full moon, and the third quarter. We know there are four cardinal points on the earth, the north, the south, the east, and the west. We know in the Garden of Eden, there were four rivers in paradise. That was Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and the Euphrates. And around the throne of God, there are also four guardians, the four living creatures. 
We also know there are four seasons, although in Kenya we usually don't know of all these, these seasons, but there are four seasons, summer, autumn, winter, and spring, and many other items of, of four that we read. The four winds of heaven mentioned in Jeremiah 49, 36, and also again in Matthew 24, 31. From the book of Daniel, we read of the fourth man in the fire. Remember that incident? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, the fourth man appeared in the fire. So even when you are in a challenging situation, a fourth man can appear, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll leave you to read the rest of the fours. Uh, five. Five is the number of human weakness versus God's grace. Because as human beings, we have five fingers, we have five toes, we have five senses. So five is thought to be the number of man, the number of man's weakness. But God, in response, comes uh, and speaks to, through our weaknesses with his strength and grants divine ability. God, by his grace, enables us to overcome our human weaknesses. So five is also the number of God's strength, empowerment, and blessing. Number six is a number for man was created on the sixth day. It represents man's weakness and his inability to achieve perfection and sinlessness. It is also the number of evil, for we know the devil is known by the name 666, and therefore evil in its fullness is represented by 666. Seven is the number of perfection and completeness. God's complete provision in his dealings with men. We know seven days make up a week. We have seven colors in the spectrum, in the rainbow. We know there are seven great land masses, the continents, and several others. And in Jewish tradition, the seventh day is the Sabbath. The seventh year is a sabbatical year. And every seventh month was holy and it had feasts, remember? Last year we discussed and, dis and learned about the feasts. And we learned the, about the weeks between the feasts. There were seven weeks between the Passover and Pentecost. And the Passover lasted seven days. And the Feast of Tabernacles also lasted seven days. We know also at Pentecost, seven lambs were offered. And the time of mourning in the Old Testament and in Jewish tradition is seven days. In the New Testament, we also see seven appearing sev several times. When Jesus taught about forgiveness, he said, forgive 70 times seven times. And in Revelation, seven is mentioned severally. They're the seven letters to the seven churches. They're the seven seals of judgment. They're the seven trumpet judgments. And they're the seven bowl judgments. They're the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars, the seven angels, the seven spirits of God. We also see the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. So the book of seven, which is the summary of the written word of God, speaks of completeness in which God finishes all things that pertain to Jesus Christ. Number eight. Eight is the number of new beginnings. In the Bible, we read that Jews were circumcised on the eighth day to mark a new beginning in their life. When there was a flood during the time of Noah, God preserved eight people in the ark. That was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. There were eight of them. And eight speaks of Jesus and the new covenant. And the church also met on the eighth day, which was the first day after the Sabbath. We go to nine. Nine is the number of finality. We know the gestation period in humans is nine months after carrying 
a baby in the womb, a woman gives birth after nine months. And we have also seen nine months even in our day. For example, in Germany, God declared finality to the Berlin Wall in Germany on the ninth day of November in 1989. And as a result of that, then communi communism started to fall throughout Egypt, I mean, throughout Europe and Russia. Nine also marks fruitfulness. There are nine segments to the fruit of the spirit. And there are also nine gifts of the spirit. So nine is significant. And gifts enrich our prayers, intercession and warfare, and gives us divine insight to solve problems. And fruit we know as something pleasant. And therefore the fruit of the spirit is something pleasant. When you read those, are all the positive things that you'd like to see in our lives. Before that, it talks about the works of evil. But fruit is something pleasant and enjoyable. And there's fruit in you, which God wants to enjoy. And nine also marks the time to build or to rebuild new visions and dreams for ministry, business, and life in general. So look in your life, there might be some cy cycles of nine that God is bringing out. By God's design, I'm born on the ninth day of the ninth month. <laughs> and uh, as I was preparing this, I also realized that I4K is moving into its ninth year. So even in your prayer and fasting, let us seek the Lord to know what is it that he wants us to do in this ninth year. We also read in the Bible that the time of prayer was the ninth hour. It talked about even in Acts. Number 10 represents human failure versus God's provision, protection, his strength, blessing, and power. In the Old Testament, we read of the 10 plagues that God brought in Egypt to war against the gods of Egypt. But at the same time that the 10 plagues were coming, there was God's provision and protection over the children of Israel. So the children of Israel were in the same country. When there was darkness over the Egyptians, they had light. So God protected them from each and every plague that he sent out in Egypt. So when we fail as man, God responds by providing law and order. And when Israel failed, God gave them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, five, which talk about our relationship with God, and the other five talk about our relationship one with another. So that it provides law and order in our relationships. Ten is also the number of responsibility, restoration, and testing. Israel tested God ten times. One of them is in the scripture that our pastor Ian read, that Israel kept on testing the Lord all the time that they were going through the wilderness. We read of ten virgins awaiting the return of the Lord. And ten also is seen as the number of double grace. Double, five plus five. And also, as people, the Bible tells us to praise the Lord with a ten-stringed instrument. Those are all our fingers. God has given us five plus five to praise his name. So we need to use uh, worship in our warfare as we praise the Lord as one of the arsenals of war. We also read that in 2 Chronicles 20, the, the battle when Jehoshaphat went out to battle, he sent the choir ahead of the army and, and worship was used as a weapon to bring a victory to the children of Israel by God's power. So our hands can serve divine purposes and in Isaiah 55, 12, we, we are told, clap your hands, 
all you people, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. So our hands are to be kept holy for God's purpose, God's purposes. Ten also is significant in the tithe that we give. In Malachi 3, we are told about the tithe to bring a tenth, our offering and unto the Lord. But in Genesis, we also read about Abraham giving a tenth of all he got to Melchizedek as a tithe. And as a result of that, he became very prosperous. And we are admonished not to give your tithe just because you have to as a matter of routine, but release it to the Lord with great joy and with faith so that God will bless us because of our obedience to his command. Often when I'm talking to people about tithing, I tell them in God's maths, 90% is more than 100%. So when you think that this month I have too much and you want to keep 100% of what you have earned, you have robbed yourself because 90% in God's arithmetic is more than 100%. So release that 10% and you'll release your blessings. The number 11 marks disorder, chaos, and divine judgment. It is a number often used by the occult or wicked people to wreak havoc. We we'll recall that there was the first plane that hit the World Trade Center. It was called Flight 11. The total number of crew who were in that plane were 11. The New York City where this occurred is the 11th state of the United States as per their constitution. And the World Trade Center in which they rammed to, destruct, to destroy took 11 years to build from 1966 to 1977. And it was destroyed on the 11th of September. So can we see the significance of numbers even in our day and age? So may the Lord help us to understand what he's saying through numbers. Twelve is the number of God's government. It, repre it represents apostolic fullness. We know there are 12 lunar cycles, 12 months in a year. And in a day, we have two segments to the day, the day and we have the night. We have 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 patriarchs of Israel. Jesus himself chose 12 disciples when he was beginning his ministry. And in the book of Revelation, the number 12 symbolizes the salvation of God's people. We read about the 24 elders around the throne of God, 12 times 2. We also read the 144,000 of, of the saved, which is 12 times 12 times 1,000. And we also read about the city of Jerusalem, which has 12 gates, each with a single pearl, and 12 foundations, and was adorned with jewels, and also 12 angels at each of those gates. Each gate had one angel, so there were 12 angels at the gates. Around the gate, there are 12 angels around the 12, uh, the 12 gates of heaven. Number 13 is a number of rebellion and tends to bring young people into an age of rebellion. You know, that's the time our children step out to become teenagers. And we know the challenges that come to, uh, to our young people during teenage. So as your children or your grandchildren are turning 13, please pray for them against this, this significance of 13, that God would turn it around for them. 14 is the number of the Passover. We read that in Leviticus uh, 23, verse 5, on the 14th day. Remember we studied that when we were studying the feasts? Then we have 30 marks the time of consecration and maturity. That's a time when, okay, we say we're an adult from 18, but when you are 30, God, uh, people look at you, yeah, so that's 30. And here we are told that if you have a 30-year-old 
who does not show signs of maturity, then there is something wrong. Today we see 30-year-olds, they still want to live in their mother's house. They don't even have a thermos. They want to use their mother's thermos. Even if they move to the SQ, they want to move with the thermos to the SQ. <laughs> Please pray for such children, that they would rise out of that immaturity and become mature people. 40 denotes a generation. It marks a period of probation and testing. Scripture speaks about 40 several times. Remember, Moses was trained in 40-year patterns in the wilderness. He also went up to the mountain for 40 days to receive the commandments. Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And the spies who went to Canaan went out to spy for 40 days. Also, the flood rains in the time of Noah lasted 40 days and 40 nights. And in 1 Kings 19, we read of Elijah fasting for 40 days. Remember the time when Elijah ran away from Jezebel and was in the wilderness, and he asked the Lord to kill him? Then the angel came to wake him up twice to eat, and he was told, eat, you need strength for 40 days ahead of you. So he went 40 days without food until he came to, the Mount, to Mount Herob. 40 days were given to Nineveh to repent. We read that in Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4. Jesus also fasted 40 days before he started his ministry. And Jesus was with his disciples also 40 days after his resurrection, before he went back into heaven. And many more that you'll continue to read there. I encourage you, I'm skipping fast because of time. 49. 49 represents the year the trumpet of the Jubilee is sounded because the 50th year is the Jubilee. And uh, during the Jubilee, people would reclaim back what they had lost in the past 49 years. Sla slaves were set free and they would be able to re reunite with their families. So 50 signifies release and freedom from bondage. And 50 is also is significant in our lives. Those of you who are approaching 50, take that as a serious birthday, not just for cake, but for serious spiritual matters. It is, a spirit, it is significant in your life. 70 marks a full span of the human life. We read that in Psalm 90. And also the children of Israel were in exile in Babylon for 70 years. We read that in Daniel 9 verse 2. As I was going through these numbers, I also looked at 60. Kenya is turning 60 this year. What does it mean for us? Can we, during this period of prayer and fasting, pray that God will give us a revelation of what he wants to do in our nation at this time. I tried to Google a bit about the significance of 60, and these are some of the things that I got. Not, necessarily, not all of them are, are biblical. Um, it's the threshold when a person enters the last major phase of their lives. Yeah? So it's a time now, unambiwa mezeka, Public servants in Ambia will retire. <laughs> Time to go home. Yeah. And those of us who are in re retirement will tell you, it's time just to put on new tires. You're just retired. You're given new tires. You know, we used to do those retread tires. So you're being given new shoes for a new assignment. Your assignments have not ended when you're 60, even if you're told to retire from that office. It's often called the diamond anniversary. I also found a scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 5 from verse 3 when Paul is telling Timothy about how to treat widows in the church. And he actually says, do not, do not let a widow under 60 years be taken into the number. 
That's the number of widows who are being supported by the church. Because uh, he was saying that those who are under 60 might still want to get married or something like that. But if they're over 60, and then there are some other criteria also which go uh, with, a, with a widow under 60 for them to qualify to be supported by the church. We also read in Leviticus 27, verse 1 to 2 and verse 7, that a 60-year-old man can redeem himself from a vow he has made by paying 15 shekels to the temple. If it is a woman, she'll pay 10 shekels. We also know that, um, that Isaac had his two sons, Esau and Jacob, when he was 60 years old. In Numbers chapter 7, verse 1 and verse 88, we read that when Moses set up the tabernacle, and the altar in the tabernacle, at the time of its consecration, they offered 60 rams, 60 male goats, and 60 lambs as a sacrifice. So 60 rams, 60 lambs, and 60 male goats were sacrificed at that time. And as in Isaiah 60, verse 1, we say, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Arise. So I'd like us to look at the gates of time. If we can turn over to lesson 18. Possessing the gates of time. And why do we need to study the gates of time and possessing the gates of time? It's to understand the gates of time and how to take advantage of them in prayer war and how to rescue God's plans that would otherwise be ignored without this understanding of the gates of time. In spiritual warfare, we must learn to possess the gates of time. In order to possess the gates of time, we need to relate it with the significance of numbers that we've just talked about, and also to the seasons of time. I've talked about birthdays, uh, our nation turning 60. Let us take those numbers seriously and ask God to give us a revelation as to what they mean because they have a spiritual significance. Each number has a coded meaning that must be decoded for divine direction to be released. Jesus Christ did specific things at specific times. You remember at the wedding of Canaan, he told his mother that his time had not yet come. And even after that, after he healed, a number of people he told them not to tell anybody because his time had not come to be revealed. And after 70 years in exile in Babylon, it was time for Israel to return to their nation. And after 400 years of slavery in Egypt, it was time for Israel to be released. So all these numbers are significant and Whatever needs to be done at that gate of time needs to be done at that specific time, no later and no earlier. So Christians must rescue time. So we have there some steps to take in possessing the gate of time. Understand the significance of numbers. Let's ask the Lord to give us more revelation on the significance of numbers. And know that all days pertaining to you and your life are determined by God. We read that in Psalm 31, verse 14 and 15, it says, But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. So our time and our days are in God's hands. And when it came to the time for Moses to rest, we know that Satan battled with God for his remains, and Satan still battles with God for our destiny. So he doesn't want you to recognize the gates of time in your life. He wants you to miss your destiny. So we must pray that God will enable us to know what our destiny is, and to pray over our destiny, the destiny of our children, and our grandchildren. 
even on their birthdays. The Bible speaks of the watches of prayer. That's in lesson 19. You can refer to it. I'll not go there. And then gates. What are gates? Gates can be spiritual or, na or natural. We have the entry point to a day at 6 a.m. and the entry into the night time at 6 p.m. We enter a new year like we have done this month on the 1st of January. Those are gates of time. We have an exit point, for example, when a baby is born after nine months. We also had an exit point from the year 2022 on the 31st of December, we exited 2022 and entered 2023. Gates are also a place of authority. A gate of time presents an opportunity to declare the will of God over our lives with authority in order to enforce things. So in your life, reorder your life at those special gates of time in your life. And the gates also are a place to take dominion. We, we use God's prophetic patterns in numbers to exercise dominion over Satan's reign and rule and to destroy them. Other gates are like legislative gates. We use the gate of time as a legislative center when we issue new bills, laws, and, cons and constitutions. We know we have many bills which pass through our National Assembly, our Senate. Those are gates. I know many of you have been there also to pray around these legislative centers. An altar also is a gate because God's people raise altars to mark a time with God, a time he appeared to them, like we read in the Old Testament about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob establishing altars at significant times in their life. Unfortunately, in Africa, we see that many of the gates of time we have not entered into them uh, with knowledge about what God wants and in his divine will. And even at independence, many nations entered in with witchcraft and bloodshed but we have time to redeem those gates of time in our nation. Time is a period between pre-eternity and eternity, and God has no beginning or end. He existed in eternity past and will exist in eternity future. Time is precious. If it is lost, it cannot be recovered. It is re irreplaceable. So when we don't make good use of our time, we are told to number our days. When we don't make good use of time, we cannot reclaim that time back. It is gone. And certain things have to be done at certain times. And if we lose them, we might not be able to gain them again. So let the Lord help us to know his perfect timing for everything that he wants to do, God's kairos, and that we may move within his kairos to do his purpose. In Proverbs 22 verse 6, we are told about bringing up our children in the way of, of the Lord. And training up a child goes up to the age of about 12. And if you establish good foundations in that child's life, by the time they are 12, the Bible promises that when they are older, they shall not depart from it. So let us be wise in how we bring up our children. As believers, we must also know our divine, divine purpose and fulfill it at the right time. Our destiny has an expiry date, and if we miss it, then we have missed it and we cannot recapture it. So let us seek the Lord that we may know what he wants us to do at what time, so that we move within his kairos and accomplish his purpose. Likewise, there's a prophetic destiny for our nation. We are often praying for our nation to enter its destiny. So there are things which, as a nation, we must do at certain times. May the Lord grant us wisdom and revelation to know what we are to do, even in this 60th year. 
In Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7, we read, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. That was the Lord speaking to Israel. So there was a specific time that Israel had to exit from Egypt. It was not any time. It was very specific. So God is specific about time and about numbers. Sometimes we don't pay much attention to God's promises and, in, and intentions for us each year. But let us take that up now in this new year. 2023 is not going to be the same as 2022. God is going to speak new things and we need to be in line with his purposes at this time. So let us seek the Lord that we may move in his timing and receive revelation of the numbers and the patterns that he has brought about in our lives that we may move according to his will and purpose. Amen. Amen. Grace sufficient for us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now may the grace 